don't say no to anything. If they ask you to, you know, to learn how to be a caterer and, you know, for a road crew, do it, yeah. you know, because you're going to learn something. Carlos, we have traveled intensely. I know. For the sessions. I know. And we have reached thousands of students and thousands of people that have heard the message of what we're talking about. But I've always been impressed with your story. You have such a unique story, inspired at many different levels. So tell me about drumming and where music entered your life. Well, when I was growing up, the music education system in the city that I live was revolutionary. Yeah. The band director, his name is Jesse Pearl, Filer Junior High School. I have to give him a, a shout out. Yeah. He had a percussion class in eighth grade that you can sign up for. And he, and he wouldn't put you in the band unless you went through that year of being in the percussion How class. Smart. And he was written up in the Instrumentalist yeah. magazine and everything. I mean, really revolutionary. And that was my base. And I saw that everything had to basically evolve from education. Where was this? Where were you living at the time? In Hialeah. I was born and raised in Hialeah, Florida. Okay, good. Yeah. And basically, I was in music education classes throughout the entire the span of my education. My senior year, I ended up as four classes of music and the two, you know, requirements, English and geography. <laughs> you know, I, I graduated like... 82 out of a thousand because they were all I was getting nothing but all A's I was I was living in the band room yeah. <laughs> and then on top of it I would go home and practice for two hours and then at nighttime we would come back and then practice marching band and then on the weekend we were doing football games so all I was doing is playing for almost six years straight. So you were doing well in music. You were extremely, extremely well. In fact, we all, there was two of us that got like, you know, partial scholarships in the University of Miami. Wow. We, uh, so those know. school programs, those music school programs, which, were, are, which were, are dropping out now, they're, unfortunately. They're, they're non-existent. Yeah. Or you have to go at nighttime or, you know, uh, you know on the weekends or, but, Music, music education is everything. So you, 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 here you're doing this here, you're starting to play drums now, you're, right. you're, you're, you're playing with different bands now at this time? Again, back then was a little bit different. When I went to college, there was a huge dinner theater circuit mm. in my area. So I started doing th dinner theaters. Interesting. And there was like basically three major dinner theaters and one had like a comedy, the other one had a straight play, the other one had a musical. So when this musical would finish, I would go to the other play, start a musical at that other place, and it was Ron Robin, and it went forever. And those, that experience still serves me today because now I work with a lot of musicians or, or Broadway singers doing the condo circuit in South Florida with the same music that I learned that back is then. That so is it's all reciprocal. It yeah. comes right back to yeah. you, you know, definitely. But the main thing was my uh, my drum teacher, because I was still taking drum lessons and everything. Local teacher? Teaching uh, you? Local teachers at the at the college. And I, by then I was going between the University of Miami and I went also to Miami-Dade. Okay, and sure. that was the turning point. Miami-Dade Community College was really the turning point for me as a musician and my life goal. Back then, all you had was applied music, and music education that's and music law that was about it but they didn't want to be a lawyer so i said well i don't want to be a band director as much as i love it i want to play yeah so i, I went back to miami dade and because i heard about the drum instructor and i know you're going to know who this guy is <laughs> His name was frank garisto <laughs> frank garisto for the people wow. that don't know yeah. was the original drummer for the tonight show absolutely. before johnny carson absolutely with jack park absolutely well that became my drum instructor wow and i told him i said look jack i want to become a show drummer I want to be the guy behind like Tom Jones or Engelbert or, you yeah. know, Sergio Franchi or stuff like that, you yeah. know, but nobody's coming down to Florida, you know. He says, well, at that time, all we had was New York, California, and Vegas. Right. So he said, you got to go to one of those three places and, and then from there, you know, become known and hopefully you can really, you know, get yourself elevated because by the time you get down to South Florida, they're not going to pick up musicians right. down there. So I made the commitment. I saved up a little bit of money. I, I said, New York is too big, it's gonna swallow me. California is too big, it's gonna swallow me. I'm gonna go to Vegas. That's, that's where all the shows were going. 
and Vegas was like incredible still. I was tour I, I went there at the very end of the era. Yeah. But if you remember the the original Ocean's 11. Absolutely. That's how Vegas was when I showed up. That was with Sinatra and, Sinatra and, Dean and Martin. You could you just go up and down the strip Bishop and it was Bishop. incredible. Yeah, what a, what a scene, all right? So but to get there, I got $800, <laughs> a Mastercard, my drums, my clothes and my records. Put it and put it in my van and head west, young man. <laughs> I only had a couple names and everything. That was it. That's so driven by passion. Passion. And just that was it. Sheer desire right. to want to have fun so and music and play. So three days later, wow. I end up in Vegas wow. <laughs> at this little efficiency across the street from what is now the Bellagio. It used to be the Dunes. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. And there was just a little efficiency. And so I, I, on the way there, I said, "How am I going to meet these?" artist and how am I going to meet the MDs and the drummers and stuff and I'm just then it came to me that night I after three days that same night I put on my tux and this is all pre you know you, it's hard for people to believe this but this is pre 9-11 security right. and everything else like right, that right. I put on my tux I got my stick bag and I was looked at it and I said well the Hilton's a pretty big one let me see if I can get into the Hilton drove around to the back <laughs> got out I ran up to the security and I went, hey, listen, I, I just got a call. I'm the percussionist. I've never been here before. I got I to gotta go ahead and fill in for the percussionist. How do I get backstage? <laughs> and the guy said, oh, just go down the hallway, make a <laughs> right and left, and you're there, right? So what I did. A, what a different time. And I, I ended up backstage during the show, and it was the Ike and Tina review. That's how I, that was my first thing. So, so you're I, backstage I, watching that show? Watching the show, but I went around from the back. And this is when I really experienced the musicianship and the, fr and the camaraderie of musicians. Yeah. I go back there, and I'm behind a percussionist, and he's up on a riser, and he kind of like turns around. His name was Leo Cameron. And he sees that I have a stick bag, and he goes, during the show, he says, and I go, yeah. He says, come on up. And I went, okay, so there was a, a step, it's a couple steps. I went back there and he gave me a tambourine. Oh my God. And the first night <laughs> of arriving, I was playing tambourine <laughs> for <laughs> I can Tina Review, you know. How fantastic. And I said, afterwards, you know, I talked to him. I said, listen, this is what I want to do, blah, blah, blah. And he says, okay, great. Well, that's what you got. You did exactly what you're supposed to do. You know, you, you use your wits and... What a story. All right. So I said, and on the way home, I said, well, it worked this night. I, I've got the pattern now. <laughs> and the next night, went to the sands. Same thing. Oh, because I always would leave at night with the tuxedo and my stick bag. <laughs> I got backstage because I wanted to see the true show drummers and see if I really could cut it, wow. you know, before I even started auditions and stuff. But I had to get back there. I had to see. I couldn't pay for the show, yeah. you know. I mean, that would blow my budget. Remember, <laughs> I only had $800 <laughs> to last for whatever. Anyway, I go to the second night, I go to the Sands, and Tony Bennett is there. I'm good. And I go backstage, and then I'm waiting for the show to start, and I feel somebody next to me. And I look, and it's Tony Bennett. <laughs> I go, and, but again, youth has no, no you know, doesn't, is not scared yeah, to do yeah, anything. Yeah. I go, Mr. Bennett, look, I'm a drummer. What do you look for in a drummer? And he goes, time, man, time. You know, and that way that he talks, you yeah, know. And yeah. it was like, it's amazing. Well, Fredo uh, Reyes Sr. Senior was, was playing like congas it. for, I think, Lola Falana. Hmm. That was the opening act, Interesting. you know. So I, I started to see the quality and the, the passion and how incredible you had to be for all these things. And hmm. I went, I could do it. I hmm. knew I had enough gumption in me. I said, I can do it. Yes, I did get some auditions that I didn't, didn't pass. Yeah. That was a true test because I, said to, I always say to people, look, if, they, if you fail and you go home, then you weren't meant to be in this you know, profession. In, in this business of what we're doing, exactly right. You know, I went ahead and by the third audition, I was hungry. Yeah. And a friend of mine had basically, by then, I was just doing all the shows as for free, just to gain experience yeah. on how all the shows. So you were playing some shows. I was playing. I, yeah. was, I was playing for, I believe, Sergio Franchi. Hmm. Uh, you know, because again, all those, 
all those shows had massive chairs and nobody could really do the congas authentically. Yeah. And luckily I could do it. Yeah. You yeah. know, and the tambourines and stuff. And I got to meet all the drummers and the MDs. You know, so that part was like amazing. Fantastic. You know, that 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 you know, what, at least I wasn't an unknown. They knew who I was. And you squeeze into by playing percussion. Yeah. You got it. Right. I show up for the show one night and the percussion says, Hey, the the drummer for the letterman just showed up. He's at the sands. He's leaving. Go over there and get yourself an audition. Oh, fantastic. So I went over there, and I didn't do the show that night. I went straight over there, met, met the, uh, you know, the leader, Tony Butala, yeah. who really was instrumental in getting me to the next level. Because there's always levels yeah. of everything that yeah, you do. Yeah. The next day, I was so hungry for a gig. Because I was working at a Dr. X pet center, a security guard, anything to during the day so I can stay at nighttime. Yeah. And I went out every night. There was no days off. Hmm. Every night I was at a different show or a different place or, I mean, I was committed to getting on a gig, yeah, you know. Yeah. But I needed, of course, by then, after three months, you know, I needed some money, so I, I had to start working somewhere, Absolutely. you know, a menial thing. Just what to, drive you know, and, and had perseverance, it's yeah. great. So by the third, by that third audition for The Letterman, and I said, I got this, I know these songs in and out. You know, and I went up there and I just nailed the audition because I was there and I, I saw the drive and I said, no, this one is mine. Yeah. You know, and, and it's funny because the keyboard player who was the MD told me after I got the gig, you know, on the road, he says, we knew you had the gig. We could just tell by how you were playing. Yeah. You know, there was just there was no mistakes. Everything was perfect. You know, so from going to Vegas, my first gig as a professional musician was in Hong Kong. That, so from Vegas to Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Now you gotta explain, just explain the Letterman, how huge the Letterman were and the what, Letterman, and what they did. The Letterman, this was a fantastic They, they like to say, and they, and they really are, were true, the Letterman were the Bee Gees of the 60s. Hmm. And it's funny, later on postscript, what has happened. Yes. You know, <laughs> they, but they always like to say, yes, we, you know, we like to tell everybody after the, the first couple songs were done, says, we're the Letterman, commonly called the Bee Gees of the 60s. How incredible. You know, yeah, the first gig was in Hong Kong, and I went to Bangkok and Singapore and Subic Bay, and you know, I mean, so what did two your weeks family in Japan. Think when your family think when you made they the were movie. super, super happy, very proud, extremely Incredible. proud, Incredible. extremely proud. You know, I remember leaving for Vegas; it was very emotional to, yeah. to leave. Yeah, sure. You know, and it's you're, you're going into the you know to the vast unknown. But you if know? there is ever a definition with the American dream, mm -hmm. that you really lived what you right. wanted to do, and then here you are in Vegas, struggling, meeting, creatively getting into places right. that you couldn't get into, oh, and yeah. then all of a sudden, the next thing you know, you're in Hong Kong. Oh yeah, you know, performing you know, <laughs> shows and stuff like that, and I stayed with them for two years. Because wow. the cool thing about them was they explained it to me, they said, look, this is, the way we work is five months on, a month off, five months on, a month off, and, but we pay you year round you're gonna be on salary, which back then was, you know, not that, like $350 or something a week, still, which was still, at that, was at still that time, was yeah. still yeah. pretty good, especially yeah. for a single guy. You know, I moved back home. I was, I was living on a bus, you know, so I didn't have any rent or anything yeah. else like that. So, and it worked, and I was working with like tremendous musicians, you know, and really starting to learn about the business, how yeah. to be on the road, you know, I mean, you know, having the bus break down and, you know, I mean, bad food, everything. But <laughs> as a kid, it's an adventure. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was absolutely yeah. an adventure. Then the next turning point came. I could see that, yes, we have the gig, but if they decide to stop, then I'm out of a gig. Mm. And I'm going, am I gonna, and I ask myself this, because I tend to think like 10 years ahead, yeah. you know. And I say, am I gonna be 60 years old and still trying to look for a gig? I said, I need some security, you know. I mean, I really do. My next door neighbor at the time uh, went on as a policeman for a Metro Day. And on the, the month off, I went on a writing assignment with him as an, as an observer. Yeah. And we started talking, and I, I was thinking to myself, I said, you know, I could, I could do this and still play on the weekends. And after 20 something years, I have a pension and insurance and everything else and you know at least let's let's see what happens so i took the test for the police department i took for a highly up police department where the city i grew up on and metro dade police department i and i passed both of them but the highly called first and i was in chicago uh and he called he says hey 
you better get down here because you're ready to go into the academy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's what I did. I went straight. I, I was home two weeks, and and it was weird to go from, you know, playing in front of crowds Absolutely. to two weeks later, you know, the traditional boot of camp. Serious discipline. Right, yeah, yeah. of that. Wow. You know, and uh, I didn't play for almost two years after that because mm. of the shift changes and stuff right, like that. Right, right. But I did start playing again. And that's when the new era of club dates came into South Florida with weddings and bar mitzvahs and conventions and stuff right. like that. They were everywhere, right. everywhere. And they were perfect for me because I found out that I could make in four hours playing what I would have to do in eight hours as, a, you know, as extra duty. Yeah. And I'd still be playing again, you know. So I never hardly did extra duty at all. But what you're doing now in production is amazing because the discipline that you have, the you're always on time, you're very organized, you have great people skills. I just but wanted to be a drum tech, though. That's it. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Uh, toward the end of my career of as a policeman, uh, again, another you you can't even plan these things out. My best friend at that time was Russ Miller. Mm. Russ great, saw great. the same thing that he saw yeah. in me. He says, "I got to go to California," so he goes to California. By chance, this international drummer, Jerry Brown, yeah. moves into Miami. Now, it doesn't start there. <laughs> it starts in Japan. <laughs> because the two of them got hired by Yamaha Drums to do a drum clinic. And they're exchanging numbers like all musicians do. And Russ says, hey, when you're in Miami, call Carlos. He'll help you out. You know, he's the guy to help you out. So a lot of this started with, with, with Russ. Beautiful. You know? Beautiful. And I get home from work. One day, and back then there was no beepers or anything. Else. There was answering machines. <laughs> we, were, we we lived by the answering machine, right? So I come home and I walk in, and I, the first thing you do is, you know, you do I have a gig this weekend or a contractor or something? <laughs> Something's going down. I turn it on and I'm starting to hear it. And I go, Hey, Carlos, this is Jerry Brown, and uh, Russ told me to call you, and da da da. And fast forward, things didn't work out for him too well, but his drums ended up in my house because he had to move to a smaller apartment. Hmm. One day he called me up, he says, Carlos, I've got a session up in you know, Fort Lauderdale, but I can't get there till later on, can you bring my drums? And I go, yeah, sure. Now he's just a little bit taller than me. I went there, I had everything all tweaked out because it was at my house, yeah. it was brand new drums. I mean, <laughs> I'm playing with all these things, making sure they're shining them up and everything. And he walks in, he says, who set this thing up? And I said, I did. He said, Carlos, listen, after you retire, there's, there's a gig for you here. There's a career in this. And I went, hmm, how about that? I said, let me think about that. It came really quick because about a month later, he says, look, we got rid of the drum tech uh, with Stevie. We're doing seven days or 10 days in Japan. Can you get some time off? And I said, yeah. <laughs> so even as a policeman, <laughs> I started like two years because I was thinking ahead. I'm going, I need to start this career. So when I do retire, boom, it's already established. Well, this is a great, great message for the younger generation and people to listen to. The fact that you were thinking ahead. Yeah, you had to. Planting the seeds. Because a lot of people of don't. Step they, two, step three, and step right, four. You know. and, if it, and look, if it doesn't happen, yeah. at least you started something. Absolutely. And you don't know where it's going to go, but right, at least right, it started right. that. Yeah. Now, and it's weird how it all is reciprocal because the person, the Lighten production manager for Stevie at the time, yeah. also worked for Hank Williams Jr. Hmm. After 9-11, Stevie decided not to work for like a year. Yeah. And I said, oh, okay, fine, no problem. You know, I mean, I'm still, I had my gig. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, so it's yeah. not like I'm going to be out of work. Yeah. And the production manager called me, he says, hey, we're starting you know, this run, this summer run with Hank, do you want to work? And I said, well, yeah. I said, now it's a little bit different than working with Stevie because you can't just set up the drums, you got to do more. So that already was great for me because it's giving me new skills, mm. you know, learning how to, you know, learning everything. Plus it's doing country, which is a whole different other thing. It brought me into Nashville, mm. which is a tremendous city. Just by then it was really starting to, to perk. Wow. It was really doing amazing stuff. But my first job with him was, was a rodeo in Kansas. <laughs> After two days on a bus, and I, 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 I'd like stumble off the bus, 
And I'm looking around, I'm going, what is this person from Miami doing in Kansas on a rodeo, you know? But it was fantastic. It was just, I did, I did six years with him. And, and then also, at the same time we were doing Hank, Jerry got a gig with Diana Ross. And since Hank wasn't working a lot, we were doing both. Yeah. Jerry and I were flying back and forth. I was doing Diana Ross as, as, a, as a drum tech, a percussion tech, and stage manager. You know, and then I was running back and learning all these skills with Hank. So every little, uh, you know, job gave me just a little bit more experience. You don't say no to anything, you know, and, and that really, really helps. I mean, tremendously. That's a great bit of advice. Yeah. You don't say no to anything. No, absolutely not. Yeah. And coming back after, uh, you know, fast forward a little bit more, I started working as a percussion tech for this tremendous, uh, you know, South Florida musician, uh, Richard Bravo. And down in South Florida is about maybe 10 guys that do 80% yeah. of all the records yeah. that are down there. Richie is fantastic. You know, and Richard is amazing. I know Lee, Lee Levin and I always would come yeah. sometimes, like, you know, go for the same auditions, you know. <laughs> so I've known Lee forever, you know. But back then, nobody really had the budget to you know, have a drum tech per mm -hmm. se, like they do in California and everywhere else. Right, right. It just so the musicians would have to like bring everything in. I said, yeah. look, guys, you guys are the the two most working musicians down here in South Florida. I said, let's do this. If I become your drum tech, we can charge whatever we can charge. <laughs> all right. I mean, yeah. even it's free. It yeah. doesn't matter because the way I looked at it, if I'm working and you give me the gig. And you say, okay, let's meet at Hit Factory or a Criteria, that is, as it's called now, yeah. at 10 o'clock. You guys can still be at home recording. And then you show up, everything's ready to go, you play, and then you leave. And then you can go to another gig and not have to worry about breaking down. Boy, great, you know? great plan. And it, and it worked out. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm basically just those two guys. Absolutely. Where did Max Weinberg fit in? Max, oh. Because of the sessions, I met a very dear friend of mine, his name is Harry McCarthy. Mm. And Harry is like Great guy. the premier drum tech of the yeah, world. Yeah. And I went to him one day when we were doing the sessions in Nashville somewhere. And I went to his shop and I met him for the first time. And I said, Harry, I've known about you forever. I want to become like the drum tech to the stars like you are. Uh, he's the guy that, you know, Steve Gadd and Jim Keltner and, you know, Rick Barada, anybody that's huge he handles everybody, yeah, calls yeah, him, yeah, you know. Yeah. I said, how do you, how do you do this? And he said, I've, I've been hearing a lot about you. I said, oh, this is how it works. You keep doing what you're going to do. One day the phone's going to ring and Steve Gadd's going to be on the end. <laughs> and I said, that's how it works in this business. Yeah. All right at least at the level that you wanted to be at. I said, okay, cool. And I kept doing what I was doing, working for Diana, working for Steve, you know, working for anybody, yeah, basically, yeah. and still just trying to do a great job. In December, like December 20th or something like that, I'm watching Seinfeld. <laughs> and the phone rings, and I pick it up, he goes, Carlos? He says, yeah, uh, this is Max Weinberg. I'm coming down there, can you work for me? And I took the phone and I said, Look at this, <laughs> just like Harry. <laughs> Harry said it exactly how it was supposed to happen. Harry's a wise you know? man. <laughs> and, and with him, just because you have to do, do the extra bit, he, had a, he was starting his big band project in 2010. Right. And he only hired me to be, to be the drum tech. That was it. We did, we did a rehearsal, and then the next day, we were supposed to switch everything from the place that we were to the main showroom. And I got there to move the drums and nobody was moving anything else. So I said, oh, let's go. I moved all the bandstands, I moved everything. By the time Max got to the gig to, for the rehearsal, he looked and everything's set up. You know, and, he's, and he said, who did this? And I went, I did. <laughs> <laughs> he says, oh, you can do this? I said, oh yeah, yeah, then no problem. Yeah. And after we got done, he gave me a nice little raise because it was almost Christmas yeah. and Max is, Super, super generous. Yeah. I mean, really sweet good guy, of a guy. Really a good guy. There's a certain, there's a quality, there's a standard that he knows. Yeah. That's what you're hired for. Absolutely. You know, and if there's only two people, oh well. Yeah. You know, but yeah. you give him that because that's exactly what he expects. That's what he pays you for. Yeah. You know, it's a nice guy and everything, but still, 
you don't want to lose a gig. But that's that professional standard yeah. that, that, that it, is needed to, for what to do. And not only do, that, yeah. it makes you a better person. Absolutely. It makes you a better everything. It, you know, you just become better at what you do, you know, because of everything else that, that you know, all these different jobs that you got to do, yeah. you know. And I knew how to do them, you know. I mean, and, and it ended up, that's how I got the gig with Barry Gibb. With Max, I had to make stage plots. I had to make drum writers. I had to do this. I had to do that. Well, I just did it because I started working because Lee and, and, and Richard had become already the the uh, drummers for, for and drummer and the percussionists for Barry Gibb yeah. back in 2009. Yeah. And I was, of course, since I was working for them, I was their drum tech. That's all I was. <laughs> I was just a drum tech. Back around 2013, I, because I knew the setup and everything, when I would go home, I would make up, you know, the drum writer, I would make up the stage writer, I'd do all this stuff. And the production manager called me one day and he says, listen, we have to get together because we have to make up a drum writer. And I went, wait a minute, and I just sent him an email, here you go. And he said, well, what about a stage plot? I said, oh, wait a minute. Well, <laughs> You know, so anything he asked for within three minutes, it was already in his email. What a lesson of preparation yeah. and hard work and dedication. But and, I did it for fun. But you did it because you saw also it was yeah. fun. I did it but, for fun, that's but all. But you saw and the that, future of yeah. what that could bring right. for you when you were there. Well, and, and, he's, and he says to me, what is your job description for this tour? And he said, well, I'm the drum and percussion tech. <laughs> he says, but you're doing the job of the tour manager. <laughs> And I said, yeah, I know, and you know. And he says, all right. And three days later they called and they said, listen, we like to offer you, aside from that, we're gonna give you a bump and you're gonna be also the tour manager. Hmm. And Barry, of all the people I've worked with, that man is incredible. Yeah. And I, I, gotta be, I gotta be saying, I was very lucky. I had fantastic teachers. Well, lucky, not so much luck. I mean, the, the, you created these opportunities. Yes, if you true. want to call it luck, that's fine. But right. you, you worked hard to create yeah. these no, opportunities I, I, that opened the doors for yeah, you. That's really yeah. what it there was. There was no, there, I, I, you did did not, this. I did not want to fail. Yeah, you did this. That's I, the standard because that you I, have. I knew, I, I've been on the other side of failing or I don't, I don't ever want to like try to go home knowing that everybody's having, you know, champagne and, and cookies you know, at, at the at, at the rehearsal because those guys got the gig yeah. and the other guy didn't get the gig. Yeah. You know, yeah. I I know what that was like. Yeah. I know how that felt. Yeah. And I and I and I vowed to myself, I said, that's not gonna happen to me. I will not go that way. I don't care if I don't go to sleep. Yeah. It's gonna be done perfectly every time. You what know? a great personal you constitution know. you yeah. have. That's really what that comes yeah. down to. You set the, the boundaries and you stuck by them. Right. And I've seen the guys too when they when they record. And they come in there and they're doing 10, 11, 12 songs. Yeah. And they're doing like one, two takes. Yeah. And that's it. I mean, it becomes the record. Yeah. You know, and, and, and they go, this is it. This is how, this is how the big boys record. Absolutely. You know, there's no like, oh, I messed up. And I got to go back and do this again. And let me punch in this again. No, 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 no. You know, they, they, you charge big bucks, you better deliver right. big bucks, right. you know, and, and that's it. That's how those, and if you see that every day, you can't help <laughs> but become better, yeah. you know, yeah. and that's really the only way, even as a musician. And after the first night, he came to me and says, I can't wait for you to, to work with you again, mm. you know, and uh, co consequently, I've got gigs already in February, March, and April from that one job. Well, how powerful, but you also know musicians. You also know about music as being a musician. Who right. were your influences in the drumming world that, that opened up your mind? Well, at the, at the beginning, naturally, it, was, it had to be Buddy. I, I was never Buddy really, Rich, yeah. yeah, Buddy was, I, I still remember what it was like to get that record, that swinging new big band, and you know, back then it was the records, and I would close the door, and you could hear the <laughs> and then the, then the band would come on, and then you, you, you hear, the power of a big band. You hear Buddy just driving it. And it was crazy because you, there was no YouTube. There was no hardly any videos whatsoever. Unless you saw him on Johnny Carson, you never saw him play. So you had to imagine everything. Yeah. You know, which made you, in some respects, a better player. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But it was powerful because you mentioned Johnny Carson. Yeah. Those that don't know Johnny Carson, that evening Tonight Show right. that Johnny had for 30 years, 
you know, which you know, which now the Tonight Show continues in sure. the process. But I mean, you know, Buddy Rich performed a lot on a that lot. show, and he was a personality. You and know. he came out; I mean, it was exciting. It was and he, he, he would play with Ed Shaughnessy on the right. show or Louis Belson. And Louis Belson, they got the drumming you know. actively involved, so we were attracted to that. You know, you don't really realize the stress of having a perfect show until you actually come back from that show. Yeah. Because anytime something happens on the road, and that's what I always tell people, I said, look, there's tons of people that said, man, if I was in charge, I, this would be a lot different, and this would do this. And, <laughs> all right, well, if you do that, if you become in charge, you have to come to the realization, if it messes up, there's nobody else to blame but you. Yeah. You know? And, and that was, that's one of the main reasons that drives me, because I'm looking at all my friends. I don't want them to be disappointed in me, because mm. they, they opened the door for me yeah. you know, to become what I do. You know, as you know, and, and it changes because of the, the industry that we're in, that every day I'm, I'm a musician, I'm a tour manager, I'm a production manager. You know, I, I'm anything yeah. at this point. You know, I'm into you know video uh, editing now like crazy. You know, it's another passion. I've seen some of the stuff you've done, which has yeah. been fantastic. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, it's 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 everything. I'm because I want to have a career for the rest of my life. I enjoy it. You know, I mean, that's the best part. You got to enjoy what you do. But well, that's the example of being really driven. Yeah. You know, on the sessions panel when we were at the universities and we've got hundreds of kids there and we're doing these productions of right. PowerPoint presentation, I asked the panel, and I, I, as you know, I've asked you. What motivates you? What, what, what drives you? What makes you get up in the morning and continue with all this incredible passion? I, I, I want people to have the same experiences that I had. Mm. I've had one, you know, one in a lifetime experiences to be able to wake up you know, in Australia yeah. and, 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 and go you know, and see all these, the, the wonders of the world that you only see on the History Channel yeah. and stuff like that. And they, they, I did it because I had great teachers. Mm. And that's what I'd really try to be is a great teacher. Like when I when I do my production part, you know, I, I don't I don't hide any secrets. Because nobody hid any secrets from me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? I yeah. said, Well so why hide secrets from them? I right. want you to advance. I want I want everybody to go to the next level. Yeah. I want them to advance, you know, the industry as we have learned it, mm. have we have grown and loved it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I, I want to be able to say, yeah, well, at least we gave them, a, you know, at least a foot in the door, you know. <laughs> and if and and if they they don't mess up, you know, they'll say, well, you know, thanks. That's all. I mean, I don't want anything more than just thanks. Boy, how powerful true. that is. In closing, what would you say to the young generation if they want to get involved with music and eventually maybe production or or widening their scope of opportunities that they might not even know now what could be there for the future? What would you say to them? Basically, as we said prior to this, don't say no to anything. Mm. If they ask you to, you know, to learn how to be a caterer, and you know, for a road crew, uh, do it. Yeah. You know, because you're going to learn something. As a production manager, you live by that Rolodex. Mm. So you're going to meet so many people that the next tour, I need somebody. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go on Google and start look. You know. You'll know who they are. You know who they are. Yeah. That you know that they work. You know, and they're great, and they go, hey, hey, yeah, that's right, let's do it again, and you know, so it, 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 your job becomes easier because you're constantly trying to be a better person. Yeah, yeah. You know, and as long as you're a better person, and you have, you know, really good feelings about this this industry that's been so beautiful to me. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, I have never, I, I didn't think I'd see a tenth of the world, you know, that I've seen so far because of the, the, the beauty of music. Yeah. The beauty of music has really put me where I am in front of you, <laughs> you know? And I mean, I get inspired by you. I mean, every time I, I go on sessions and I, and I get to hear your, your, your words, your empowerment is, is just incredible. Your books are incredible, Thanks. you know? And they make you a better person, mm -hmm. you know? Because you really, you know, I don't want to be the next Don Familiar, but I want to take maybe one line from him. Yeah. You become a much better person, not even a musician. You become a better person in this world. That is fantastic. You know, I'm, I'm so, it's so exciting to hear that your, that personal constitution that you have, Carlos, is really a foundation that people must study. Your constitution and how you do things must be studied right. because it's fantastic. And I must say, Officer Gusman, I wasn't speeding <laughs> when I went to that light, so please bear with me. Carlos, you have done fantastic <laughs> on behalf right, of the sessions. Thank you so much. <laughs>